All right, we'll wait for people to join in and then I'll start the intro. You can already see the attendees going up. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Bandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Many of you must have seen me through many of these webinars. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is circular economy in healthcare from theory to practice. We have Emma Burlow, founder at Lighthouse Sustainability, who is moderating this webinar. She's been moderating webinars for over two years on Be Waste Wise. And just as a slight aside, uh, she's also running a carbon literacy for business course. And uh, she's looking at opening it up globally across the world. So if you want to know more about it, please get in touch with her. You'll find her on LinkedIn. Or if you want her email ID, you can drop it on the messages and we'll share it with you. Uh, today, Emma is going to talk to Tom Dawson, founder at Revolution Zero, and Paul Rodbury, who's a country manager at Vanguard Medical Devices. As usual, we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A section. We also have polls uh, to ensure that uh, you're engaged through the course of the webinar. Over to you, Emma. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Welcome, everybody. I know people are still joining. Oh, hello, everyone. Yeah, great. So, um, Better just to say that use the chat as fully as you can. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it and use the Q&A for any questions. I'm really keen that everyone gets to uh, interact as much as possible. So thanks for joining. It's midday here in the UK, um, but I know for all of you, it's a range of time. So thank you if you've got up early and good evening if you're uh, settling down for the evening. So my name's Emma Burlow. As Sveta says, I've um, moderated a few of these panels now and I really like to get uh, cutting edge people together to talk very openly about some of the challenges that we've got particularly around circular economy and carbon so hopefully today um, you've got a really good idea um, of where we're starting to make inroads into circular economy in healthcare um, and also some of the challenges and how we're trying to look to overcome those. So just, I'm just going to welcome my two panellists and thanks for joining me, Tom and Paul. Um, firstly, Tom. Tom's a clinician, a medical technologist and the founder of Revolution Zero that we're going to hear a bit more about. This is a UK based company that's on a mission to displace single use medical textiles, including masks that we're also familiar with, but also aprons, gowns, surgical drapes, everything that you need in a hospital really uh, to protect uh, staff and patients with more effective economic and sustainable reusable alternatives. So welcome Tom, thanks for joining. And Paul, here's Paul, he's worked in the field of medical devices for 17 years um, and medical remanufacturing for five of those and he's essentially introduced remanufacturing to the UK healthcare market. So this is something that, as we'll discover, was commonplace, was displaced by single use, and Paul and Tom are both looking to bring reuse and remanufacturing back into healthcare to make that concept a reality. Paul's built a team and a business delivering circular economy to healthcare providers, NHS, hospitals, and private groups. So welcome both. A few people are still joining. Um, before I hand over to Tom and Paul and start the questions rolling, Sveta, should we have our first poll while people are still uh, filtering in? Great. So really open question to get the ball rolling. Do you think reuse is the answer to reducing the impact of single use items? Do you ask one choice, please? Do you think it's definitely that we should be designing for reuse? Do we think it needs more testing and education? Do we think recycling is the answer for single use in healthcare? Uh, or do we think reuse should not be commonplace in healthcare settings? Give that a few more seconds. Should I share the results or not? Yeah, please do. Oh, 
Oh, wow. Great. Good, good, good. So 62% of you saying definitely. So you're in the right webinar. <laughs> definitely want to find out more about reuse. There's an acceptance from a third of you that we need more testing and education. And there's a small number of you um, who think that recycling is the answer or, or reuse is not the answer. I'd encourage all of you, from those of you who said, yes, definitely, you, you need to ask, more, uh, ask us questions so we get those across today. And those of you that said no, again, ask the questions that you need to know the answers to. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will be a good outcome from this session. Great. Can we just close that? Fab. Okay. So I'm going to start with you, Paul. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about Vanguard, what you do, um, and uh, what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing me on to today's, uh, today's webinar right. as a panelist um, and for allowing us to talk a bit about what we're up to. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're on a, on a journey. And uh, we're obviously uh, developing and, uh, and, and doing what we can to expand into the world of, of medical remanufacturing. Um, essentially, what we do is we take some previously deemed single use devices uh, that are used in uh, acute care in the main, um, in, uh, in the theatres or oper oper operating rooms and cath labs, devices that would ordinarily be used and then just thrown away. Um, and what we do is we send them to our plant uh, where they get an initial clean, they get laser marks and some traceability involved there um, which is obviously a critical element uh, they then get thoroughly cleaned thoroughly decontaminated they get repackaged using as much recycled packaging as possible uh, they then get um, uh, obviously a, these devices are ce marked a, again different regulatory regimes around the world mean we have to do different things and essentially bring that product that was going to be thrown away and and bring it back into into market as a as a new device that is built from or is essentially the same as the old device. So that initial single use device that's made somewhere in the world, uh, for example, Mexico, where some of the harmonic scalpels that we collect are made uh, using valuable earthly resources, shipped to a hospital somewhere else in the world, used on one patient and then thrown away. Um, uh, we can actually say, well, actually, you don't need to do that. You can actually reuse that very safely two times under the under the, the certification, uh, obviously bringing in a, a degree of circularity. Um, to that to that process uh, and there are inherent benefits to that um, which is a 50.4 percent reduction in co2 by using a remanufactured versus a new um, there is a 28.8 percent reduction in abiotic resource use um, and they are also coming in at around half the price of a new one as well so there are environmental benefits and there are fiscal benefits uh, to what we what we do as well um, so in a nutshell that's uh, that's what we do and and whilst it's, um, you know, we would love to be doing a whole lot more um, uh, you know, of remanufacturing of a whole array of uh, single use devices, um, our portfolio is limited to those that we can safely remanufacture, um, but there's still some uh, significant benefits to healthcare systems around the world. So I hope that kind of gives you a bit of an insight. Great. Thanks, Paul. And what, just for the, the benefits of the audience, what devices are we talking about? Where would we find those and what would they be used for? Yeah, so the mainstay of our point and, and you know, remanufacturing globally um, has been going for over 20 years in places such as, as in the guys that we know it has been going for over 20 years in places such as the US and, and Germany. Um, and the mainstay of those portfolios are expensive single use devices that are complicated. Um, so uh, and, and, and uh, the sorts of devices that a hospital sterilization department would struggle to to reprocess, um, uh, certainly, certainly safely. Um, so EP catheters or electrophysiology catheters uh, are used in uh, cardiac procedures. Um, they're often a thousand dollars plus. Um, uh, they have platinum valuable metals in the tips. Um, and it, it's just a huge, a huge part of their, their, their practice is to obviously choose A thousand dollars for a single use item. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and another, uh, so that's one tranche of portfolio of our portfolio. The other tranche is in, is in uh, surgical. Um, devices uh, such as direct energy, so uh, harmonic scalpels, uh, ligatures, etc. There's there's a whole uh, array of, of products in that group. Um, so those are two of the mainstays of, uh, of the portfolios that we can remanufacture. In other places such as US, where the uh, regulations allow class one devices, you can even have some of the smaller, cheaper, more simple devices, things like pulse oximeters, cuffs, etc., can be remanufactured. Um, so so those are the main areas. Um, is that 
uh, again, addressing the single use uh, devices uh, that are used across a, a hospital uh, in, in general. No, it's a very small group, right. but, but we're hoping that the principles uh, of that and, and hopefully in, in time, the design of the, some of these other single use devices will make them more reusable, remanufacturable, etc. So that okay. so obviously the, the, the really important bit is that a remanufactured device is safe to use. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, that's obviously one of the, uh, the the governing restrictions and rightly so. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, thank you, Paul. That's given us a really good uh, insight and overview. And I think we'll we'll dive down a little bit more into yeah, what the opportunities are in, in, the, in the next 30, 40, 50 minutes. Tom, likewise, could you give us a quick overview of Revolution Zero um, and some of the products that you're involved in? Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. It's a good it, and um, yeah, great, great to um, Hear, hear what you have to say as always, Paul. So thank you, thank you for that. Some re really great stuff. So I think you've pretty much hit a, hit a, um, a point on the head. The products we're involved in, well, it's a lot more than products, um, as as Paul also alluded to. And I think we you know need to remember this with circularity. It's not simply about getting the best product. It's really about the whole system. It's about the 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 workflow. Uh, it's about all the logistics and all the other stuff. Um, but to answer the question, um, it's medical textiles, as you alluded to earlier. It's been masks. So everything from the, the surgical mask, the surgical mask, which have been really the, the uh, unwanted plastic poster child of the pandemic. Mm. We see them on the footpaths. We see them floating in waterways. We see them on, on sea, on around, tied around a seahorse on social media. Mm. So this sort of, this sort of um, waste really spurred us into action and in what we saw but it's also uh, also surgical aprons, um, gowns, uh, and and drapes. Uh, aprons around three times the the weight of plastic is going into uh, into single use, so it's either going into incineration or landfill. So we're looking at and we've developed um, reusable alternatives. All of those uh, careful consideration of materials, careful consideration of reuse. How do we reprocess them? Um, we again, we have to make sure that they're safe, and our aim is to make them more effective than the single-use counterparts, which you can do because you can make them out of more expensive materials. If you design from reuse, you can put a lot of attention into that design. Uh, our masks, the filtration system, it improves over time. It improves with reuse, so it's really, um, you know, really important to think. You need to think differently in with with all this stuff. Uh, consideration of the environmental impact of, of laundering or decontaminating, of sterilization if you need to sterilize it, and then looking at, at the uh, once it hits the end of that reuse life, what do you do? So we're looking at repurposing, um, converting into other types of garments or e even within medical but outside medical, and then recycling, but recycling always at the end, uh, always at the end. But um, mm. yeah, that's uh, probably enough from me for now. No, that's great. And, and thank you for, for diving straight in there with the systems issue, because you know this isn't just about reusing a, a product one, two, three, four, five times. This is about shifting from a linear to a circular um, system, isn't it? Um, I've just got to say, thank you for everyone popping your details in the chat. We've got people from India, Manchester, USA, Australia. I'm just loving it. I can't read all your comments. I'm sure Seth is, but but thank you. It's so great, great to hear. And I hope I hope you'll all keep in touch. Um, all three of us are on LinkedIn, so do connect. Great. Okay. So let's go back to the poll then. Um, we're at best a recycling economy, and in terms of plastics, we're we're not even really that globally. Um, what, um, how do we get people to understand that reuse is preferable to recycling in, in a healthcare kind of environment? Tom, do you want to start with that one? Yes, yes, certainly. So I think we need to, um, you know, we need to consider the environmental and also the cost. And, and, and when I say cost, it's not just in the cost of subcontracting, it's the cost of staff management. And uh, people often don't... Um, don't, in healthcare systems, they don't cost in all that, all that thing, staff management. Um, it, most importantly, in an environmental cost. If you have 
something that's been made as a product is all that energy, all that resource, that water and, and you know, as I say, energy resource that's gone into manufacturing that product. Why would you then break it down, spend all this energy breaking it down into its component parts to then build it up into another product and potentially, depending on the process, lose some of the quality of that underlying material. We have got really valuable and precious resources in Paul's words. And these valuable and precious resources don't just extend to precious metals. They also extend to plastics. The issue here though, is how we have the conversation, how we think about things. We think of plastic as cheap because it doesn't cost much money. However, it costs a lot to the environment and it costs even more to the environment when you waste it. But when you recycle it, it also costs the environment. So recycling is certainly not. We need to keep it in the system and as active as possible in the system for as long as possible. It just makes so much more sense efficiency wise and also for the planet. Mm, great. So it's about educating people in that point. I think recycling is seen as a, a quite easy, quick thing to do. It's kind of pop that in the bin, off it goes someone will recycle it but as you're saying Tom you know a lot of that resource is then down cycled and, and the materials are lost and you start over again with a new a new uh, virgin material product. Paul have you got anything to add to that how do you talk about reuse versus recycling? Yeah I'd, I'd probably echo um, everything that Tom Tom just said um, and I think you you also hit the the nail on the head when it comes with the word educate so you know we're all we're all learning uh, from a, a sustainability perspective, um, and there's a spectrum of people who are experts, and there people, there's a spectrum of people who are just beginning to realise actually this is something we need to be uh, incorporating into all walks of life, not just in terms of uh, healthcare, but everything. So what's the first? Step? Okay, so let's try and send this off for someone else to deal with uh, as a waste, and it can hopefully be re recycled. That's a good thing, right? Um, and and maybe it is. Um, and in some some cases, it, it, it obviously it is. But we all, we all know in terms of the waste hierarchy, reuse is better than recycling. And it's and it's uh, uh, sorry, yeah, reuse, and it's just about that education piece. What does that actually involve? Understanding the process of uh, the particular uh, device or product or thing that you're looking to dispose of, and and how do you do that best? Well, you know, let's try and reuse it. it means that you don't have to dispose of it at all. And you don't have to buy a new one, which takes up those valuable uh, uh, earthly resources that we've just alluded to. So, yeah, I think education uh, for all of us, but particularly you know, for the people that are using these 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 things, is uh, is obviously uh, critical. Mm, great, brilliant. So, um, I'm going to go straight to a question from the audience now, actually, which is linked to how do we get this take up? Um, what have you found the barriers to, to take up within the NHS or private healthcare? So. Um, Paul, straight to you, and then I'll come to you, Tom. Okay, so um, uh, the, the barriers, well, I, I guess firstly, I'd say that in our travels to the, the healthcare institutions around the UK, which is obviously where our expertise lies, I'd say the mood is really shifting towards the, app, you know, the, the appetite is, is moving towards trying to do a, a, you know, much better from a reuse, a recycling, you know, from a sustainability perspective per se. So I'd say that generally the the openness to talking about this is, is, is expanding, which is really encouraging. Um, however, there is still a, for, for us in particular, what we do, obviously the actual awareness that remanufacturing of these devices is a thing, is, is a start, so there's awareness uh, around that. Um, and then uh, just belief around, because uh, obviously they've had, sing, a lot of places have had single use uh, is the way forwards. So changing that mindset, changing that belief uh, is, is another barrier, um, and it obviously involves a, some, a degree of education and, and taking on people, people on a journey. Uh, there's operational challenges, you know, hospitals are busy places. Um, how, how do you get people's time and bandwidth to actually think about doing something uh, a little bit different? And there's a, and the regulations is, a, is another barrier, and obviously that varies depending on where you are in the world as to what regulatory regime you have to operate under. Um, and there are restrictions therein, but you know, those restrictions are perhaps there for, for very good reason. Um, but you have to work around that. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit of a, you know, a bit restricting uh, in some ways. Um, the, the, we, we remanufacture other companies' original devices. So the original manufacturers want you to keep, or want places to keep buying new single-use devices. 
So there's anti uh, remanufacturing activity going on by the uh, original manufacturers. So the, oh. yeah, the list the list of barriers is. Oh, there's a lot is, of barriers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and 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 then you have like the just the inherent barriers of well, can you safely reman remanufacture or re, you know make this a reusable product? To Tom's point, is making sure that you know the the actual original device is designed with that in mind. And if it's not, which often it isn't, then you have to overcome those physical uh, challenges of actually making it again, you know, so that it works in the, in the hands of a physician, exactly the same as the predicate device. So, and the, all the processes to ensure it's clean and sterile and, and all those other things as well. So yeah, there's a, there's a list of barriers. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you for taking them on, Paul. I think uh, uh, we'll come on to the opportunities because they must outweigh the barriers, right? Otherwise, uh there isn't a future in this but yeah. but tom oh, yeah. absolutely uh, absolutely yeah yeah, that, yeah right? good i'm hoping so but but tom if you've got any uh are you, are you um experiencing the same the same types of barriers yeah the same the same types of thing and i think if we think of it's it's on the in great list paul it's really good i'll i'll just have to say it slightly differently so i can contribute something but yeah mm -hmm. the um 30 30 years in, in our case, and I think actually in, in Paul's, Paul's case as well, of increasing um, an increasing reliance on a single-use culture. So there's been a single-use culture. It didn't just start straight away. Previously, reuse was a default. Mm -hmm. People went, this is precious, we reuse it. They used to reuse and resharpen their scalpels and you know put them through a sterilizer again. You know, we see these old medical devices. Same with uh, when I um, started as a as a clinician, when I was scrubbing up, we we always used to go into reusable gowns, reusable drapes. So it's been twenty to thirty years of an increasing um, culture of single use. Um, the assumptions that people make. So people assume because it's been done this way and it's been a progressive shift towards single use. People assume that we are in a progressive society that's always getting better because there's this shift there. They've always assumed based on that progression, that single use must be better. So is that assumption? Um, other barriers, and again, as, as Paul alluded to, but it's the clever marketing. It's a clever marketing on the part of people's single use. Um, you can argue either way in different ways. Um, and you know, we, we, know, we know where the truth, truth lies and how we, I think we can um, do that. And then I think the other, um, the other two things just quickly, again, as alluded to, is infrastructure, uh, right. especially now. So decontamination infrastructure and control of decontamination infrastructure uh, and then resistance to change uh, mm. is the other barrier. People don't like change. And I think all of those come together. Wow. Yeah, so quite a big job. So go, going back to your comment, Tom, about having to look at this as a system, there's absolutely, you know, there's little point in just targeting one sort of niche area you've got to look at lots and lots of um players lots of stakeholders lots of parts of the operation um so one of those and a question here from richard really good question infection control okay so this comes up a lot do you get so richard's question is do you get different reception from different infection control teams in different it said UK, but healthcare providers. So do you, do you see a difference in different providers? If so, what can be done to address this? Uh, Tom, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, certainly. I, so I work with a lot of infection control um, people. Um, if we have a conversation with them and they'll engage with us, it goes really well. We're extremely well educated, extremely well referenced, and we have a strong argument. And the, and the argument is, would you, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, I understand we've got people from all over the world, yeah. would you rather trust something that has been cleaned to your country standards, mm -hmm. close to your facilities, in a controlled environment, where you can just walk, you can walk there or visit there, or you can just go down the road and check it's all right, or would you mm -hmm. rather trust something that's been packaged a thousand miles away or two thousand or ten thousand miles away and sent over so what would you uh, and not necessarily to the same standards that you're used to that you're doing your your approved stuff mm. so you can actually one of the things you can do and this is about co-locality and reverse logistics and all those different things but you can actually if you've got something that's 
close by that you can actually yeah you, know, you trust the local people and it's about the the need for some locality and circular economy and not transporting mm -hmm. as much stuff around the world and all over the world as much as we have been uh, so that's that's one of the things with infection prevention control the other is just yeah is just essentially uh the 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 straightforward evidence the evidence that we have um but there is really a wide spread so as i said people who've had their careers in infection prevention control their careers have generally been for 20 to 30 years the people who are senior this has been progressive and i'm saying progressive uptake of single use over 20 to 30 years so because this is all they've done they've got that inherent reinforced underlying mm -hmm. belief that single use is better and when we have conversations it's refreshing how many go oh that makes sense mm -hmm. that makes sense we can understand why we want to do that control things as we're doing in our facility in our place so yeah that's that's a great point, Tom. Um, having control is 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 everything in infection control, isn't it? Um, Amira made a comment in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure that single use products are safer than reused sterilized products. So you know you you made that point very well. Paul, what about you? Are you get do you get different receptions from different um, infection control teams? Uh, yeah, yes, we do. Um... And it's uh, for, for all the sort of reasons that Tom's just mentioned, uh, you know, that there's uh, there's a variety of, uh, of perspectives in some ways, but they're all built on the underlying trend that, uh, you know, single, single use is the progressive way way to go. However, um, I'd also say it comes down to the individuals uh, who you're talking to as part of you know, our implementation of the of the our program into hospital, uh, we always ensure we speak to infection, you know, IPC, infection present, prevention control, uh, to make sure that they're obviously on board, uh, that they're they're versed and that they're happy with with what we do. Um, and I'd say, you know, obviously we get we get challenged and, and that's good and, and healthy uh, to ensure that we meet all the, all their rules and regulations and requirements in those regards. Um, but we also get met with, uh, I guess, a variety of people who are of huge support say we should be doing more of this. This is something that that the future, you know, our future depends on, and there are some who aren't quite that far uh, uh, along along the line towards uh, trying to do more. Uh, so it does come down to individual individuals, their uh, sort of individual circumstances and their 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 belief in, in where we're heading to. Mm, brilliant. So education, which must be quite resource intensive for you guys. It takes a long time to get to have these conversations to instill trust. Um, so my next question is then what needs to happen uh, to see reuse, you know, getting a higher priority in the sector? What, what would you say, Paul? What, if you could wave a magic wand, is it education? What, what needs to happen? Yeah, I think so. And it's, um, uh, I think education is probably the key, is the, is the key word. Um, and, and, and appetite and openness to, to change, I think, which Tom sort of mentions one of the big, uh, the big, sort of in, in, inbuilt human barriers, I suppose. Um, but what we have been blessed with, I know Tom's the same as well, is, is there are places who have been really willing uh, to work uh, with programmes such as ours, as ours um, and have, have really sort of embedded it into their, into their standard operating procedures. And we have some really good case studies um, who have, can say, well, actually, you know what, we're a hospital just like you. We're doing procedures just like you. And look what we've been able to achieve, both in terms of the environmental benefit, but also in terms of the, the fiscal benefit uh, mm -hmm. as well. And, and, and that's a really powerful uh, tool in terms of sort of just opening up the conversation of the place saying, well, look, you know, th there's an op opportunity here for you to do the same and more. Um, so, yeah, I think think that's that's something that, that really helps when you have have a, have case studies uh, uh, supporting you, amongst other things. I'll, I'll, I'll let Tom go next. Mm. And Paul, have you got those cases on your website? Or can people access those? Yeah, and if and if not, feel free to DM me through mm. uh, through LinkedIn right. or whatever, and we can uh, we can furnish you with those. Um, and there's more coming all the time. And the the so we've got case studies just around how the program works and what it delivers, but also, um, and this is to one of your other points around uh, the safety and efficacy mm -hmm. of a remanufactured uh, device ready for for reuse, and and how that performs in the hands of physicians just as well as the original uh, devices, which is obviously important. And in fact, our procedure is geared to, uh, to make sure so we test each and every single device. We don't batch test. So arguably, you know, it's difficult to get real life data on the failure rates mm -hmm. of the originals, but actually arguably, you know, ours, ours should be at least as good from a failure perspective, if not better. So uh, there's more of that coming through all the time. So there's a whole wealth of supporting literature in that regard too. Brilliant. Well, 
Really good point. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely great. Tom, anything anything to add so, on that one? Yeah, I think really good points. Uh, I think the big enabler would be an even playing field. Ah. Uh, mm. And when I say an even playing field, because of this, and I'm going back to this, this 30 years increasing dependence on single mm. use, what has followed that has been procurement frameworks, which are yes. increasingly targeted to single use, mm -hmm. commissioning frameworks that are re increasingly targeted to single use, and regulatory frameworks, which are also increasingly targeted to in in single use, and also the underlying infrastructure, as they say, the systems to actually deal with the the trucks, the lorries, the waste bins, the landfill, the incinerators, um, all those sort of things have increasingly been targeted to process single use. So if we can get an even playing field, mm. yep, we've we've got a we've got a, yeah, it, it will rapidly and rapidly and quickly be taken up. So we've designed ourselves into this bind basically over yeah decades and you hear the same all over actually i heard that exact exact analogy yesterday with public transport mm. in that we've designed our cities around cars mm. so now we're all trying to get onto bikes and use public transport but you know lots of cities particularly uh, smaller cities are not designed for that um so yeah we've designed ourselves into this um so we have to redesign our way out of it um, yeah, yes, yeah. their healthcare system is single use by design. Yeah, interesting. And, and just to add to just to add to that, I mean, so so you know what you asked, what are the other, one of the other enablers, and you know, and and the very fact that we're on a webinar here now talking about this, uh, touching you know all four corners of the world, uh, it, it, it feels like is is great, and and I think that that upswell swelling of of drive from people on the ground, the customers of some of the original manufacturers, the people that use the cities that want to have a different, you know, set up in terms of how people get around. If, if the, the feet on the street keep moving in that direction, then the rest, hopefully that systemic change uh, will, will sooner or later mm -hmm. start to bear fruit. And you can see the green shoots of that kind of coming in. Are we going, you know, we're getting a bit sort of, uh, 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 philosophical about it but uh you know you can f feel as, and see those green shoots of, of change starting to come in we've just got to go faster haven't we? Mm, absolutely given given the, the carbon benefits that you both both mentioned so let's just talk about that piece because i've got a couple of questions here about sort of looking at this globally um do you see differences in how the uk or maybe europe paul i know you're working in germany as well um and other countries are adopting reuse do you think there's you know, there's obviously a spectrum, but so anything you can tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so, and, and obviously this is specific and pertinent to what we do. Um, and, you know, as, as we sort of mentioned, to, uh, mentioned at the beginning, there are uh, com countries that are way further uh, along the line than us um, in terms of adopting re reuse in, in, in for the devices that we can remanufacture or remanufacturing per se as part of their standard operating procedures. So the US uh, and Germany are definitely two geographies that are, are further down the road than us in that regard. Originally, though, those those um, two healthcare systems were doing this to try and drive financial gain, rather than having to, and and uh, so. But but then you have the the additional sustainability benefits as well, which helps to further perpetuate the program. Um, so and then there are other places like Canada and Israel um, who are also. Uh, quite well in, in, in terms of remanufacturing are, are quite advanced. Um, Japan also, uh, which is which is good. So so but it does, and then there are other countries where there isn't the same sort of regulatory regime. And it goes back to Tom's point where you know these devices are are just you know reused anyway. Um, but mm -hmm. they, you know there's not they don't have the same regulations and uh, you know they just kind of have to get on with it, use reusing them out of necessity. Um, so, so it does depend on, so in argue, you could say, well, actually those, those places are actually further ahead than we are. Mm. Um, but you know, you have to operate in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, your own regulatory regimes in, in terms of where you are. Um, so that just gives you this kind of scope, I guess, in terms of the UK, uh, naturally we're a bit conservative, I think by nature. Um, uh, but then also when you look at, uh, the net, the NHS's drive to net zero, you could also say that we're, we're quite progressive and, and we're sort of hanging on to the coattails of that and uh, and that's help, certainly helping us uh, broaden out. Mm, no, great. And that brings us really brilliantly on to another question. Question from Terence, who I think is in the States. Uh, what do insurance companies think about reuse of medical products? 
I'm um, thinking from a US perspective, but you've just said, you know, the UK and Europe are, are cautious in that respect as well. Would an insurance company, for example, approve reuse of an EP catheter on a cardiac patient? Paul, that's one for you, I think. Yeah, so um, so again, I'm not uh, fully au fait with all of the uh, uh, regulatory requirements from the US, but what I do know is that um, uh, remanufacturing is, is a big business. It's a big industry uh, in uh, the US. Yes. Uh, I know that they serve um, the vast majority, I think it's 5,000 odd hospitals across the U US. And I know that, that remanuf they have remanufacturing programs in the vast majority of them. There's a tiny percentage that don't. So uh, I would say that uh, electrophysiology catheters and other remanufactured devices are being widely used in those locations and that the proportion of those patients will be insurance patients. I'm sure that those conversations have been had a long time ago and that, yeah, that those, those sort of, the T's have been crossed, the I's been dotted that it's, that it's okay. Um, particularly, bear in mind, it is a big uh, insurance-based uh, healthcare, healthcare system. Yeah. And so I'm... So, so I think so. From my perspective, I think the answer is yes. But like yeah. I say I, I have to add the caveat: I'm not an expert in the US. Uh, no, but you've never come across that as a barrier in the UK, or yeah. And I think your uh, point, very well made, is that actually you've got a lot of con you've got more control in this circular system than you have in a single use system, which I think is a really interesting point that people forget. Again, they think because it's a disposable item, somehow it's lower risk. Yeah. And why um, and, and why would an insurance company have a have a have a question about it any more than anybody else? Any more than you know, so yeah. it's uh, we we have to as do all of the remanufacturers uh, across the globe have to ensure that the product coming to market meets all the all the requirements yeah. just the same as a new device. Um, you have to have your your CE certificate or in the US it's a five ten k FDA approvals. Um, and if you have that, it's coming to market. That means it's safe to use on anybody, whether you're an insurance patient or whether you're a self paid patient or a public patient so uh yeah absolutely no that's a really really good point and tom i'm going to come to you now because i know from previous conversations that that you've done a lot of work um around the standards to to get these products um you know to be able to use be used in a healthcare setting have you got any learnings that you can tell us from that yes i think i think if we have a look at the standards some of the standards again regulatory um they are set up for single use so Again, this has been an area where it's taken quite a lot of work with um, with actually in initially national national regulatory bodies. So working with them, talking to them, saying, well, if we hit all those same tests and we sit for those same tests in independent laboratories, uh, will you consider allowing registration? And then that those conversations, which then take place over several months, eventually you can get registration, but then you have the then you, once you've got the registration, then you have the um, the national, um, not necessarily, not necessarily what, not the actual national um, certifying or registering of phrases, but the ones that actually might buy something. So, so the Department of Health uh, mm -hmm. in different countries, or the National Health Service, or or a different health service, um, then have to be convinced. So they then need to go through and double check all the testing and the assurances. Then you may get some approval. You've, you've already got the registration, but then you get a national approval. And then once you've got the national approval, then you have to get the approval for the reprocessing in the actual system. So there's quite a few different mm. steps that you have to go through. So by the end of it, it's really solid. It's really good. You know, you know what's, you know what's there. You've gone through it. And, and it seems extremely frustrating, but we are, as I say, we in a relatively short amount of time, both yeah. Paul's company and, and our company have undone decades, decades of, of binding the system. We've mm. unbinding it methodically, but we need to n make no shortcuts. It's all it's a long game. Um, mm. It's a long game. Do it properly. Do it extremely well. Do it with diligence, um, which is which is what we're doing. Fantastic, Tom. Yeah. No, I think there's a maybe not a misperception but there's um i think few people would really appreciate how much you have to go to to get, go through to get a reused item into uh, a theater you know um so it really is a, a mountain to climb but for that reason the rigor that you have to go to um you know that side of the business case at least is as you said really really solid tom 
So staking with the, staying with the business case, so this is all about how we can increase adoption um, in the future. So a question from Gina, does the NHS um, engage from a procurement perspective on a UK level uh, or a national level? Do you have to find entries at all different levels that then you'd lead on to UK deployment later on? So, so how does it work? Do you start at the bottom and work up or do you start at the top and work down? Tom, do you want to start with that one? Um, you you work on every single direction. <laughs> right. Yeah, you get you go you go from the top up, um, in, in the bottom down. Mm. Uh, so yeah, we've we're fortunate enough to have great engagement um, on the ground with people mm. on the ground, um, which is what you need. You need real life, um, you know, case studies and models and people mm. working and. As Paul said, the, sh the shift is yeah. There's a real big shift towards um, towards adopting this. So, for instance, you know, ninety percent of NHS staff want more sustainable, more sustainable healthcare, um, and with that, they also want less waste. They they can mm -hmm. see see things such as uh, medical medical devices, medical instruments, um, and also textiles as being being very wasteful. So you're doing it from that. But we're engaging. As you, as you well know, Emma, we're engaging at a national level. We're mm. engaging with national procurement as well. Mm. Uh, going down there and, and certainly national procurement in both Wales and England. Um, and then on the ground in, in, and at, at quite a, a high regional level um, in the other two nations in Scotland and, and Northern Ireland and in, in the UK anyway. <laughs> uh, so similarly with you, Paul, are you having to attack this from several different levels? Yeah, absolutely. So I completely concur with what uh, what Tom said. You have to uh, ensure that the, uh, I guess, the umbrella uh, of of uh, in, of NHS England, NHS Scotland, uh, and NHS Wales uh, are on board. They support you and uh, help to uh, kind of facilitate your entry to market um, in in some ways. And then, and then you know, it's difficult because obviously you have, they have to have a, a degree of neutrality. Um, but uh, that they can promote you as an, as an option. But that, that, that's being helped by the green movement, I suppose. Uh, underneath that, you then have the procurement organisations which, go, which govern all the frameworks, et cetera. Um, so you have to ensure that your, um, your products are, uh, uh, and your offering is available on, mm. on that uh, because that's a compliant route to market uh, for the individual hospitals. And then you have to have the individual hospitals say yes, this is something we want to do. This is something we want to procure, and to ensure you, you know, go through all of their relevant processes and procedures uh, as well. And then underneath that, or alongside that, you have to then have the clinical clinical buy and mm -hmm. ensure that the clinicians are actually saying, well, yes, this is something that we should be procuring. Uh, therefore, you know, that's that's a key. As and there are other stakeholders too. Um, so it's all of the key influencers and and key stakeholders in that procuring uh, decision, right from the, the the actual person using the device to uh to the the, the system on, on high mm. uh, you have to have it all absolutely wow it's quite a task you know it's not your average uh go in we've got a new product do you do you want to buy it is it you know it's it's multi-pronged yep. um it's frustrating it in a way you know for me that it has to be like that but this is about a shift isn't it you know from as you said a really embedded way of working um i'm going to stick with the the business case and, and uh, ask another question. So the question comes through here. How do you balance the commercials? Uh, Paul, you mentioned testing each device, which sounds expensive. So how do you balance that? I mean, you mentioned some savings, Paul. So even with this processing, you're able to offer 50% savings. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So, <clears throat> so from a, uh, I, I guess from the, the, just from the commercial offering, um, we have to encourage hospitals uh, to, to allow to collect the devices in the first place. So there's a harvesting. We actually pay a, a nominal fee for each device. So these devices are just ordinarily throw away. So from a, a hospital's perspective, there's an immediate little income stream, which is great. Uh, then they have the reduction in, inherent in reduction in waste. Um, and then obviously, yeah, if they're using the devices at the, at the other end of the process as well, then they're, they're, there's a saving to be made there. So there's there, and that's the, obviously the price that we can uh, bring these devices in. And we have to provide incentive in order for people to, to do that. Then we have to try and do everything else uh, within within that constraint. And, um, and yeah, there's a lot from just, and Tom mentioned some of this, just around the logistics of getting these, 
these devices in, in and out of, of the plant. All of the initial validation to ensure that the material composition and that the, uh, the actual devices can be safely remanufactured, all of that testing, all the R&D work and all of that, the processes of cleaning and deconning, packaging, et cetera, have to, we have to do all of that. Then we have to get them certified um, to show that those processes are really robust, um, which obviously there's cost involved, involved in that. And then you actually have the process itself. And each and every device comes in, it gets the, like I say, the laser mark, the thorough cleaning, uh, the thorough testing, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, as, as well. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's difficult, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, again, if you believe in, in, uh, in, in what you're doing, you know, it's a proven model in other parts of the world, you just need to get that scale. Yeah. Yeah. So you're proving that the commercials work, which is the main thing. Tom, how have you found that that side of the business case? How are you pr proving that the commercials stack up? So yeah, it's it's a um, it depends on the it depends on the um, I guess the item in many ways. So if we have a look at something that comes off a production line really really quickly in single use format, so mm -hmm. let's look at the Type Two R mask or the surgical surgical mask. They can be produced very very cheaply. In fact, they can be produced less. Than the cost of decontamination, right. so you have to have a look at you have to have a look at the balance, and but also how much it costs to waste it. So, we are aiming to be cost neutral for those. We're not there yet. We're developing robotics, um, all sorts of different different things because it's a really important thing um, to do this. But still, even though we're not cost neutral, there's been uh, a bit, it's our biggest product as far as uptake and sales goes. Everyone wants the because again, partly because the the mask has been really the poster child. Uh, if we look at something specialized, such as a reinforced surgical gown, if you put them in one of our mobile decontamination units, I'm going through to the whole process as Paul's alluded to. So if we do a build right from the ground up of one of our mobile decontamination units, we put three staff in it, we work them for 260 days a year for seven and a half hours a day, we can get savings of 200 thousand pounds a year for one module wow so that's mm. um yeah so it's quite considerable and we look at that so overall when we look at the whole spectrum of everything we estimate we can save every nhs trust or cluster of two or three hospitals around half a million pounds a year in savings wow. so it's, it's quite overall it's you know we've gone for one end with the masks not currently economically viable but we're getting there right to things that right now yeah, come and get them. They 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 really say and they're really high quality, super high quality. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's just about this shift, you know. Budgets are uh, important to every single you know operator. So I think just sort of being able to prove that, if you like, is is it's it, the proof is in the pudding, really. But if if a hospital, I don't know, are you working in any of the same hospitals? So Tom, Paul, have you got? Are there any hospitals that are getting both of these bonuses? So, so, so Tom and uh, and I do uh, share contacts who who allow us to uh, from time to time. So yeah, I mean it's uh, again, but you're looking for people in the in the locations who really get kind of what we do, um, and and can help to drive that change in the in the hospital. And uh, you know whether that's sort of my field or Tom's, there's they're often the, the, the same people. I agree with, agree with that, Tom. Yeah, it, absolutely. And and Paul and I are still we're still on the on the search for the Holy Grail, which will be an integrated project where mm -hmm. we can. We can both work together in a system, actually maybe some other reuse um, circular, circular economy providers to actually do a full system. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be, that would just be be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, maybe there's someone on this call that wants to be that champion because from what I'm gathering from what you're saying, quite often it takes a champion within the hospital to start this ball rolling. You know, so so don't underestimate the power of you know personal influence is yeah. that your experience Paul has it come down to individual contacts quite often yeah I mean I mean these uh, and I'm sure this is the same for hospitals around the world they're big busy places mm. you know, and and to make uh, things things like this uh, happen uh, you know it, it involves a, a number of constituent parts who have to come together now sometimes we're the glue the glue between those constituent parts right. to make stuff happen um, and that's fine you know we do that that's part of what we have to do uh, but it doesn't half help when there's somebody else in there who knows everybody uh, who's really on uh, a drive to be more sustainable or there's an economic drive, depending on your reasoning, um, and can see the benefits can, and can help. Uh, mm -hmm. It just means that those internal conversations happen faster 
and things can move uh, move more quickly. And and that can be anybody. In, in, uh, and often, sometimes it's a sustainability lead for the hospital. Sometimes it's from someone from procurement. Sometimes it's, it's a lead surgeon or a lead or uh, a lead champion. Uh, the anaesthetists are also a very uh, good group that we've come across. Uh, who are very acutely aware of their environmental uh, footprint, particularly around the gases that they use. Um, and they, they have a number of touch points. They're in a lot of the areas that, that, that we work as well. So it can be uh, a number of different people. Um, but yeah, it definitely helps. Mm, brilliant. That's absolutely great. Thank you. There's loads of questions coming in. I'm conscious we've got 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask some really quick, snappy questions just to see if we can cover as much as we can. So uh, just a really quick one for you, Tom. Do the mobile. Uh, units go on a hospital site, or do you do them regionally? Yeah, so th so they can be uh, they can be either they can be put in a car park, um, put next to a hospital, energy scavenging off a hospital unit, installed mm. within a hospital building, um, or it can be off site off site. So if there's an energy reclamation plant, we could put it next to there. Um, key thing to look at is transport. Uh, and, and so forth. So for in London, we're doing a model where we've got electric cargo bikes going across the city, um, which is coming up very, very soon. So um, watch this space for that one. Mm, great. And um, Paul, I think this is one for you, but for both of you, um, are the manufacturers of these devices uh, seeing this opportunity uh, and designing them to be more remanufacturing? You mentioned at the beginning, there might be some resistance there. Mm -hmm. But in theory, that's, you know, another way of embedding this process, isn't it? Yeah. So so obviously we, we collect a lot of different companies uh, kit. So the original manufacturers, um, you know, again, it's been going for a lot a lot of time in uh, in places like the US and in, in Germany. So, so you know, the, the original manufacturer are very aware of remanufacturing and what, what that brings um, from a, uh, yeah, again, from a drive to try and encourage hospitals to use more single use devices. They'll do what they can to to stop. Us by having iteration, software upgrades, all those sorts of things. Um, but um, I think that, and I really, this is my hope, I suppose, is that uh, the mood of change and the mood from the customers mm -hmm. will help to enforce that the new products coming through are designed to be reused or at least remanufacturable where they can. And I think that gracious, you know, gracious is not perhaps the word, but there is, they do accept that perhaps we are part of the ecosystem of supply. And I can only hope that, uh, you know, that, that, that'll mm -hmm. change. Uh, but yeah, generally now they try to halt what we do. Um, all, although we hope the future will be different, um, mm -hmm. albeit in, in markets that are mature, such as the US, actually some of the original manufacturers have their own remanufacturing capabilities to compete with the remanufacturers. So there is, there's some healthy competition to it's me. It's bizarre, so. isn't it? So in some areas, they've actually cottoned on to it as a good idea. And Kartik put a, mess, a question in here about um, extended producer responsibility, EPR, if people um, aren't aware of that. So that's coming down the road at quite high speed, although it's not fully um, fledged yet, as in we don't know fully how it's going to be. But there are a couple of questions here about the role of the manufacturer. Um, and um, so Kartik asked about extended producer responsibility, EPR. Um, and then Janine has mentioned here um, that um, regarding diabetics and the insulin pump sets, there's a lot of waste. Should the manufacturers be more responsible for the packaging and the materials they use? Um, so I don't know if either of you got a comment on that, but I mean, guess we would say yes, but have we got anything else to add? <clears throat> so, sorry, Tom. So, yes, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, I yeah, so what we we do is in, integrated when we have our products, we have a circularity fund. So we put a a proportion of our product that goes to making sure that the end of life it's looked after. That comes, that basically is built into the cost of our product, which can still compete. So I think that um, and that extended um, manufacturer um, responsibility really needs to extend. I know in Spain it's gone to legislation for many many products where you have to put the the cost of end of life. They talk about recycling there, but yeah, we like to be a little bit more, to so say, circular, mm -hmm. circular earlier than that. Um, but no, I think I think there's it's really important that people are responsible for what they produce, and they make sure that's also within their business model as soon as they they cost it cost it in there. It's important. Mm -hmm. Just just to add just to add to that, I think there's yeah. um, some good uh, legislative legislative changes coming through, yeah. particularly in the Nordics. I've got a feeling it was 2025 that uh, medical device manufacturers, supply hospitals are responsible for dis disposing of the packaging that goes with uh, their products. Um, so yeah, it might be worth having a, having a little search around that. 
Yeah, there is definitely uh, moves afoot. As like I say, EPR is coming down the road, but we're, you know, we're not quite sure how that's going to land yet. But I think, you know, what we're seeing is this groundswell and I think it's only, uh, you know, only really going in, in one direction, that's for sure. Um, just another couple of quick questions then before we close. I'm really keen to get as many as we can. Oh, Richard says, Tom, I know of a trust with lots of waste heat coming from a CHP plant, combined heat and power plant, happy to introduce you. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to connect with Richard afterwards. And, and one other question for you, Tom, directly from Richard, uh, for fabrics um, or to medical textiles, fading can come up as an issue or a concern um, for things like reusable curtains. Have you come across this? What is this fading, issue? did you say? Fading of, of fabrics, yeah, that have been yeah. reused and washed. Yeah, certainly. So, well, there's all sorts of, I mean, the um, curtains can, can last for a, a long time. And again, it depends the quality quality of the curtain and also the quality uh, and the print techniques that you use. We right. can also now, we've got technology now, we're working with a organization in the US uh, where we can actually sublimate, sublimate print the curtains and provide that with a coating that will um, kill basically bugs within two millimeters mm. to produce oxygen radicals. Um, and actually the natural fading shows when it's not killing as well. So you then wash it and you wash it in the same in the, in the same um, product and that can um, that can work. So there's all sorts of different emerging technologies that can um, that can cope with that as well. Mm, so you right. can refresh you can refresh that fade with, with something really good. Yeah good. Excellent. So Charles in the chat has said that he agrees um medical device manufacturers on a on a coasting trajectory as there's little ex external encouragement upon these to investigate remanufacturing um we can only hope that there's an internal interest i think there's going to be a legislative uh, pressure as well i really do it's such yeah. a big carbon footprint so let's just wrap up then with with kind of how this all we talked a lot about the resources and keeping the resources in a, a circular loop but how does this link to to net zero for both of you, uh, given that healthcare has got such a big carbon footprint. Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, so so obviously having a very detailed life cycle analysis of, uh, of using remanufactured versus new is a key component to that. We know that there's a 50.4% reduction. So uh, everything that's, uh, that, that we do, every device that's used, uh, is uh, is gearing into that. Obviously, we have we are not perfect. We have lots more to do. Um, so you know we're building a company's own net zero um, uh, plan as well. Uh, but yeah, remanufactured absolutely uh, fits into that. So reusing rather than creating new, we have it documented evidence from a place of very high repute that says it's good uh, from a carbon perspective or better from a carbon perspective anyway. And that data is so important, isn't it? If you're a you know, net zero manager for a uh, hospital or a trust or a region, you really know, need to know those sorts of numbers. So I think that's something really valuable. Tom, I know uh, that carbon's a key driver for you. How does how does what you do fit into uh, net zero? Yeah, well, in every in everything we do, really, uh, it fits in well, um, and be and beyond net zero, especially with the removal of waste from systems, waste that poisons the ecosystems that will sequester the carbon or take that carbon back up. Um, but it changes across every single every single one. So, for instance, for a a disposable surgical mask, we save ten grams of of uh, emissions. For a disposable sterile surgical gown that's large it's a kilogram of co2 so it's quite there's quite a range quite a change but then you've got the water savings for that uh, for that gown if you use the water properly of 900 grams just compared to a disposable and around 300 um, 280 grams in waste savings so there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of savings across across the piece uh, and then we're trying to save on all areas. So the decontamination, getting around to relatively carbon neutral decontamination, laundries, sterilizations, all this sort of stuff is working towards the future. There's a long roadmap, but there's big gains to be made now. Brilliant. Well, I, I can only thank you both. Um, it sounds like you're both on a major mission. Um, it's the right mission. Um, and, you know, the opportunities, we haven't even had a chance to talk about the opportunities, but they're clearly vast. Um, and you've put a really, really good, not that you have to put a case across, but what you've done is you've filled in some of the gaps, uh, some of the misconceptions maybe about where reuse uh, can sit and it uh, needs to play a really big uh, part in, in the net zero challenge. So 
I'm going to wrap up now, Svetta. That's been absolutely amazing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tom. As I said at the beginning, um, we had over 50 people. We've still got about 40 left. Please connect on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to reach all three of us. Um, lots of people here. Thank you for all your contributions. I think out of all the um, webinars I've done, this has been the best in terms of questions and engagement. So there's clearly a long way to go here and you know, use the power of these connections uh, to make it happen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Emil. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and thank you Tom. Just a reminder to everyone, some of you have questions about the recording. The webinar is recorded. It will be up on the Bway Splash website as well as YouTube channel in a fortnight. And you will have access to it then. And you can find everyone on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. Have a Bye good all. day, afternoon, evening. <laughs>